Thanks very much for the invitation. Uh, it's a privilege to be here. Uh, a lot of people in the room much smarter than I am about this, this, uh, this stuff in, in a lot of ways. I think we're all trying to figure out the space. Um, and um, I think, especially in the API space, you tend to spend a lot of time trying to figure out the engineering problems, like which version of auth do I have to use? How do you help the customer do this? How do you figure out the business model? And that's totally normal because we're really trying to push the boundaries in a lot of ways. But once in a while, it's good to step back and go, holy cow, like if this stuff works as advertised at scale, it's going to be mind blowing because it's going to change pretty much everything. And I think, um, you know, that, that's, that's uh, the, the thing. If you look at the title of the conference with the Kraken, I'm not sure it's a great idea to release, unleash Krakens. They tend to have pretty negative effects on shipping lanes and stuff like that. But if you think about what's happening here, it's going to have a, a seismic effect on a lot of the way business is done. So I'm going to try to drill down into this a little bit. Uh, I'm not going to... Uh, clicker is not working. Or the other way around. Okay. I'm not going to talk about 3Scale too much. We power about 200 APIs. You can go to 3Scale.net. You can sign up for free and actually run your API. Uh, with our system, we have a, a lot of great customers, and I'm happy to talk about it afterwards. But uh, I started with this, which I think most people will have seen. Uh, so the software is eating the world quote from Mark Andreessen. Uh, his idea really, this is from 2011 in the WSJ, is to kind of say that almost every major industry is becoming software driven. Uh, and um, his argument at that time was a bit more like it's going to be Silicon Valley's companies that, that kind of dominate the world which uh, didn't resonate perfectly with everybody, but I think the quote has taken on its own life and it's really meaningful. If you think about telephony, Skype went over the top of the physical pipes, right? Netflix has gone, is, is kind of the ultimate generation from we started with videotapes, then we went to DVD, uh, then, then we were shipping DVDs in the post, then not going to Blockbuster anymore, and suddenly we're, we're t putting that over the top and it's a software company that understands the needs of its users and how to deliver that's, that's kind of become dominant. And you can look at many different industries. And it's not necessarily only new companies. It's also, for example, if you look at retail, retailers are sucking in data, figuring out what their users want, and going, and going there. So there's a huge change. And I think the software is eating the world argument is really that um, software is, being, is enabling the world to do new things that it couldn't do before. And most comp companies are kind of struggling a bit to catch up with that. But when they do, pretty amazing things are happening. I have a couple of examples. So Amazon. Uh, is a pretty clear example in retail space. Pixar was bought by Disney, and Disney was kind of the original animation studio in a lot of ways, a successful one. But Pixar just came along and said, we can do this animated uh, on automated boxes and do all the rendering. And everyone said, ah, it's going to be crap. It won't have the same feeling, etc., etc." Cost them a few billion dollars. Uh, I don't know if people have seen a Lytro camera. Anyone have one, seen one? So Lytro is a tiny little camera. They ship the camera. When you take the photo, it doesn't actually take a photo. It takes the light field. It takes all the light that the camera can see. You don't choose a focus. You don't decide how to position it. You don't put any filters on it. It just takes all the light in the room. It captures the moment. And you use software afterwards to figure out which focus you want. So I could take the photo and change the focus and get different faces. And what they did last week, I think it was a TechCrunch article that, that had this, they actually said, oh, you know those devices you bought? Well, they have a Wi-Fi chip in them. We didn't tell you, but um, if you get the software update, now it's going to be Wi-Fi enabled. And that's kind of incredible. Like, you just send devices out into the field, and then a little bit later you go, you know what, it's, it's going to be better now if you download this software update. So there's some pretty incredible things where hardware and software are merging together. And I, this Philips example, Philips Hue, uh, the best thing about this is Philips have figured out how to charge 200 bucks for three light bulbs. But basically, these light bulbs are Wi-Fi enabled, and you can control them from your iPhone and from an API. So there's this merging happening uh, in physical and, 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 and online uh, kind of worlds. Uh, and um, the question is, you know, where is all that going? And I, I believe that it's not only that software is starting to proliferate into all these different businesses, but also that APIs are going to change software fundamentally as this happens. So I'm going to spend a bit of time on some of the things which I think everyone, it's like preaching to the choir here. I think everybody's kind of on board with what APIs are doing. But the follow through of where this all ends up is, I, I think, a, a pretty big deal. That's worth saying. So um, there's kind of three, two major things that I think APIs are doing to software. The first one is obviously that uh, it's making things remotely addressable. If you have a piece of software that's running somewhere that isn't connected to anything, it has a very limited use. 
It might still be doing something, but it has a limited use. It's like the first iPhone games were just, let's play Tetris kind of thing, right? Um, but as soon as you connect it to something, its use expands massively. It can get more data, it can download data, it can do things. And, um, and kind of that's one side of the, the, the coin, giving these things interfaces. And the second thing is, when I build software now, I no longer do what I did before, right? I'm actually going to connect and be richer in what I can build because I have all these external resources. Uh, and that's a really big deal. It changes the way you build software. Um, uh, John Sheehan mentioned that yesterday, and I'm completely, uh, I'm, I'm going to be a John Sheehan di disciple after that because I think it's, a, it's exactly what's happening. It's distribution in, in software construction. So I'll, I'll talk about where we end up with that. And so I think this third thing is that when you put these two things together, some pretty uh, crazy things happen. Um, but I'm going to talk about each of the first two first. So remotely addressable really means opening some kind of addressable interface across some kind of network. And so if you look at, there's tons and tons of examples of this, so I'm not going to spend too much time. But for example, London Transport's a customer of ours. They're opening a ton of data about all the, the way the tubes run in, 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 in London, where the roadworks are. And they no longer have to build those apps that they had to build before. They didn't have to go to the end user. They can spend their time es essentially building the road and other people can build the cars. If they try to build the cars, they're basically going to have to build a one-size-fits-all app that everybody bitches about. Um, but if they provide the roads, then everyone can build whatever car that they want. And this is a huge change in the way that kind of public service is delivered. We already heard the, the Netflix story. It's really about distribution. Take a company like Johnson Controls. It's a Fortune 100 company that runs commercial real estate all over the world. They build HVAC systems and lighting and stuff. They have APIs onto those buildings to suck out the data and control those systems back in. So people can now build apps to control commercial buildings. That's a pretty crazy, crazy thing to do. Because the first thing you think of, well, I can build an iPad app and I can switch the lights on and off. Well, that's pretty cool. But the next thing you can do is decide, well, on cold days, you know, change the configuration of the building. On warm days, change the configuration of the building. Where do you get the data? Well, from some weather API somewhere, right? Um, and uh, I put Evernote here because it's kind of my favorite platform. Not only have they built for all these different environments, they've also built things like, uh, they bought things like Skitch and Penultimate, which are meet their mission, which is take notes, right? And they have new interfaces onto their platform. And the, they've even, if you've, you can buy a Moleskine uh, notebook, which is a, a, a Evernote enabled, you have these little labels and you can take photos and tag things in your notebook that then get, then get digital. So I think just on the API side, the key thing is that, so these are just some categories of APIs in programmable web. There's a ton more of them. In our kind of incoming people inquiries wanting to build APIs, we literally get inquiries about all of these sectors and many more every month. I mean, it's really diverse. It, there isn't really a sector I can think of where there isn't, there isn't demand. Um, this is a, a survey that was done on API survey. Uh, it was organized last year by John Sheehan. This is just one of the data points. What's interesting to me is, although it's not a big sample size, these are all different size companies. It's not just startups. It's not just big companies. It's basically everybody uh, that's kind of doing this kind of thing. We did a survey of 1,000 APIs on Program Web last year just to look at various dimensions. And one of the ones we looked at was business models. And people typically think of these big developer ecosystems as what people are doing when they're building APIs. But it turns out that many people are doing internal things. They're augmenting their existing product. They're building a partner ecosystem to distribute content or build an affiliate network. There are a lot of different diverse business models. And what that tells me is that people are software enabling their existing business. They may see new opportunities as well, but they're really taking their new business into a new dimension. So essentially, software is eating the world, but it's basically useless software unless it has an interface. So that basically means you need an API. You need an API somewhere to talk to these objects that you put out. There's a whole bunch of difficulties and challenges when you open APIs. Um, a lot of those are engineering things that we spend day in and day out trying to fix. So vendors try to help. You do those internally. I'm not going to talk about these too much. But essentially, the upsides are so powerful, we're driven to solve these problems. So how is it changing software development from the other side? right? So my application development, how is that changing? This is a Wikipedia quote on what a software library is. So I would say that APIs are the new libs, the new libraries. You used to pick your programming language because, hey, Java has tons of libraries to do this. C has tons of libraries to do that. Why would I use Ruby? It has no libraries. Uh, obviously, then over time, Ruby got more and more libraries. Um, different languages have different specialities. 
But if you look at the definition, uh, it's something that has a well-defined interface by which the behavior can be invoked, right? Uh, and that's happened to be a piece of code on your server, but there's no reason why that can't be somewhere else. And now typically an SDK is a wrapper for, for an API. So why do you build stuff with APIs? What's the compelling motivation? I think we all know it, but it's kind of worth saying it. Um, some examples, so speed. Uh, I don't know if people know shirts.io. Uh, I haven't used the API myself, but it's just a cool concept. You can just send in some JSON and it'll print a t-shirt and send it to wherever you said you were gonna be. Uh, imagine mashing that up with just like a Twitter stream of DevOps Borat or something, right? And have a shirt delivered like every, every uh, probably every two hours in that case, but uh, you might want a quality filter. Maybe you can link it into the cloud score of the poster or something, I don't know. Um, but you can create an app that does this in hours. That is impossible in, in the world five years ago. If you look at Live, Live Plasma is one of the top mashups listed on programmable web. Um, and that's been around for ages. It's actually a Flash app and it pulls in YouTube data and um, Amazon data and it just allows you to browse your, what you might want to buy in terms of music. Um, that really probably didn't take a ton of building and it's still there after five years. It was launched in 2005. There's actually another top mashup which is called um, Beam Me Up Hottie, which is uh, hot or not plus, I think, some ranking thing. But unfortunately, it's been discontinued, so I'm not sure that uh, the rankings are totally up to date. But I'm sure there's plenty of those apps out there that were very easy to build with all these back, uh, you know, with all these resources. Another one is richness. Doing a credit card transaction, you can go integrate with Visa, but even if you integrate with Visa and you don't use PayPal, you're still using an API. Because unless you're a bank, you can't physically do a credit card transaction. You can't do a credit card transaction on the physical object that you have in your house. If you have PayPal in the middle as an API, you can do things you just couldn't physically do before. And weather data, for example, you can't have a lib, a Java lib that gives you weather data unless it's connecting to something external or it has its own weather station, right? So you've dramatically expanded the functionality you can pull into a piece of software. Um, also offboarding, so if you look at New Relic, uh, for example, there are many examples of this. You're dumping data out from all sorts of devices to try to figure out what you want to do, but the device itself doesn't have to have a ton of storage capacity. It can actually just be doing its job without having to store this stuff locally. It's really about getting stuff off the device and allowing us to build lighter things. Reliability is another reason, so we use SendGrid, so I've absolutely no problem putting them up here. They're a great service. Um, you know, why the hell would you want to run your own mail servers? I mean, some companies need to for security reasons and so forth, so it's not always the case, but there are very clear reasons why ThreeScale as a company, we have our core competence, we're very good at it, but sending email at scale is not one of them, and we don't want to spend time on that. There are downsides to using external APIs. Many companies can't for some reasons. Uh, where's my data going? Uh, what happens if it's down, et cetera, et cetera. But really, the day-to-day -day of our job and most people's job is mitigating these issues because the reasons for doing it are so compelling. They're so compelling to use external resources. You would, you would just kill yourself in the market if you don't use what's available that your competitors are using. And so the sum of these two is the thing that I think is really interesting. So I think, I think this, the, the dates on here are probably somewhat unfair, but until 95, you were doing this. So the outer ring is the organization and the blue thing is the software. You're building a big piece of software in one piece inside your organization. Then we get to the SOA world, which I worked in for plenty of time, and are really those protocols allow you to build systems that are connected, uh, separate, separate processes that talk to each other. Some of them would border other organizations, so they would reach out, but most of them were really internal, and there was an assumption that you kind of controlled all the resources in some way, right? And really where we are now is this which is the software is owned by different organizations and you really have API links between them. So the thing that you're building is fundamentally a different thing that you were building a few years ago. And so here, this just enables companies to specialize. So we have Flipboard, for example, it sucks in feeds from all sorts of different things. So I could be a Facebook user. I could go and um, send my holiday photos to Animoto which would use Amazon to go render that and basically construct a video with some music attached and that ends up on, my f on, on Flipboard for one of my friend's feeds. That's nuts. I mean, that is totally nuts. I mean, wh how, how incredible that you can do this. And I think this is what we see in kind of the software tech company uh, kind of ecosystem now. Transpose that into the world of, uh, you know, farming or medicine or retail or whatever, you're enabling all these new businesses that are coming into the software world to do this as well. 
and the mashups are going to be so much more like arriving, getting a t-shirt arriving in the mail, right? That's a, it's a completely different thing from, from doing this. I mean, this is already amazing, but uh, I think to try to get out of the box that APIs are really enabling these connections. And one way to think about it uh, is uh, that businesses are able to componentize, componentize themselves. I can't even say that properly. So one way to think of it is, and people are probably familiar with the software development pattern model view controller, right? You separate the model, which is the data from the view, which is the audience or, or however you're rendering it, and the controller, which is the business logic. This is a very smart way to build systems. Um, but this is a way to build systems on single servers or for a single app. But you can think of it as doing this in the real economy. Uh, so if you look at models, I mean, um, some of these companies do multiple things, but this is data, right? Bloomberg, Xignite, etc. They focus on being the data store or the place where you can actuate. A view is where the audience is. Uh, you might have a tweet deck, you might have a flipboard, Yahoo, one of the biggest assets it has, is it has a huge audience that it still reaches. Um, even Apple, in a way, is an audience company because it's giving devices which are sort of the, the glass in front of the user's face and sucking in content and control and other things. Um, controllers, and there are actually less of these, but what's super interesting to me is companies like Zapier and IF and IFTTT are coming out. So you can actually use the Philips Hue and something else together with a weather service to switch, the, switch your lights on blue if it's going to rain. Right? So you're starting to get this automation, uh, which is a pretty big deal. Um, and essentially what I think is that companies are able to become components in very large complex software systems. And that ups our challenges a lot in a lot of ways, but it's also extremely powerful. And the APIs are uh, eating kind of software part of it. Um, I think it, it really is that they enable a different way of writing software. And um, you've got to think about the connections, not just the pieces of software code functionality. I'm not really saying that um, MVC is the way to go. It's just to put an idea in a head with something concrete. There are plenty of other architectures. There are plenty of other ways to build systems. Um, um, Mike, yesterday from Layer 7, was talking about be a node and not a hub, right? That kind of concept, be a node and not a hub, isn't possible without point-to-point -point connections between all those nodes. You need the links, otherwise you don't have a graph, right? So this is a pretty big deal and we're changing the way we program. And the kind of conclusion is, so we have the world and then Mark Anderson said that software is going to eat, we had to have a Pac-Man in here, right? There was no other way around it. Uh, so software is kind of eating the world in the sense that the world is becoming software enabled. And APIs are kind of eating software in the sense that software is becoming API enabled. And that means it's addressable, you can talk to it, you can make it do stuff, and you can have effects in the real world. And those things are really kind of what I wanted to get to. Um, people kind of took that as a negative or Silicon Valley claims it's going to overtake the whole world, but actually more than anything, companies worldwide can benefit from software to drive their processes and they can benefit from APIs to be connected to. And the challenge for the rest of us is to figure out, well, how do we still make this stuff work when you know, these things are far apart, or we don't control all the elements and so forth. And there are a lot, a lot of interesting problems to solve. Um, but the main thing I wanted to kind of put in people's brains, so I'm going to, you know, to make a claim here, is I think that this shift is as radical, at least almost as radical, but I'm going to say as radical as when the web kind of grew up and became commonplace. Why? Because the web was essentially, holy cow, we can have our data. We just put it up there and people can read it. That's amazing. It's, it was the first time people directly talk to their audience, and however large or small it was, and have humans interact. But the paradigm was humans going online and interacting with the stuff. The paradigm that we get with APIs and software which uses APIs is that people can just program against it and create a whole other layer of complex experiences that we wouldn't be able to do before. So I think it is as, as, as deep a trans transformation as we saw then. And, um, you know, we're at the beginning. We're trying to figure out if we can get the right award signature in, in this thing to get this damn thing to, you know, send the SMS on time and those kind of things. That's where we're at. Uh, like a, there's great APIs out there. I think every single person that we know that's running great APIs, they're always saying, you know, I think we should change this and that and the other. There's a lot of figuring it out going on. So we're in the very early days. Um, but when we get to... 500,000, a million APIs, 
things are, are going to be pretty crazy. And uh, I think that, you know, um, whether we're unleashing a Kraken or we're uh, doing something else, I don't know. But um, at the very least, we think it's, it, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty big deal to be working in this space. And uh, we're happy to be there, be here and have these conversations. And that's it. And I even have one minute 40 left. Thank you. Open up the floor for a few questions. All right, all the way in the back. So just to be fun and controversial, uh, the last two companies I started and even the last enterprise thing I did, um, as a find the business guy, I love APIs. I love them, you know, and I especially love the ones that are, that are free for a while. But as a, every single one of those projects, as they grew, they shed maybe 70% 70, 70 of the APIs that they were working off of and either built them internally after that, you know, learned from it and then build it internally. And then, you know, about the 30% were remaining that were fundamentally like we just didn't want to do anything with that. Uh, do you see that trend elsewhere? Do you have, what do you think about that? Do you mean the APIs you were using that were external to you? Or do you yeah, mean they were external and then as we grew and we actually started to double down on the business, we didn't want to dabble with other people's stuff, we started building it internally. Uh, so I don't know. I, it's hard to make projections. I always as companies get big, they, they get more capacity to do things that may be better or more specific to them than an external service, which maybe somewhat generic would have done. But my, I would posit that if you do that today and as you go forward, it will kill you <laughs> in a lot of ways. And the reason is that the velocity of change on some of these infrastructure, especially infrastructure type of things, which are hard to do, uh, outside and the shared services will be way faster than you can keep up with. And if your competitors are nimble and they're using those infrastructures, there is a, at least a significant danger that they're basically going to be faster than you at some stuff that becomes core. I don't think that you know you should have APIs externally for everything, um, but you keep need to keep. I think companies need to keep an eye on what they do in house versus externally because externally sometimes you just get this extreme velocity of improvement in the services you're using. Um, and uh, that's kind of dangerous if you get caught with your own legacy stuff, or at least if you get caught in the mindset that, hey, we built this, so we better use it. Like if, if you build it and you have an advantage, and then you get to the point where the advantage stops, well, ditch the in-house stuff and go back to the outside, I guess what I'm saying. The many yeah. question. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. Uh, you put a Pac-Man, I would have preferred you, pr you put a, a Kraken, but... Uh, ah, yeah. No, no, it's okay. Uh, <laughs> just a question. So, um, software is, is being eaten by APIs. Uh, software is eating the world. API is software, but what will eat APIs? What will eat APIs? Um, oof. Um, I think probably um, what will happen as you get more and more... AP this is like completely out of the box, right? I know... Um, as you get more and more APIs, um, you're going to get in situations where you get very complicated up applications with uh, race conditions and dependencies and, and you really need a better model on top of the world and the resources than just working at the, oh, we can connect the X to the Y to the Z. You, you actually need a higher level paradigm. Um, you need the semantics of the data models to be clear. You need, you need to have contracts between these systems that you can actually reason about, um, you know, uh, if this guy doesn't deliver on my SLA, what am I going to do? I think there's a whole higher level that will get constructed. Um, but I don't know what it would be called. And um, I think it might take quite some time. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much.